My name is Gabe Villamizar, and I'm a global sales evangelist at Lucidchart. And I'm, again, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming. And we launched a, our Lucidchart global webinar program about two and a half years. And I have five awesome new tips that I want to share with you on a few things that we learned along the way through trial and error, and a few things that were repeatable and scalable that I hope you guys, you guys can apply uh, in your webinar programs, whether you're starting out, whether you're continuing and, and updating. So uh, to start off with some of my background, I started at InsideSales.com in 2013, and I was there for a little bit about a year, helped them grow the inside sales team and marketing team, moved on to HireVue. At HireVue, I was there for about two years or so. Uh, again, helped out at another hyper growth stage uh, startup company for two and a half years. And most recently, for the past two and a half years or so, I've been at Lucidchart. And again, we're on this rocket ship. And, and I'll, I'll tell you guys a little bit more, more about that so you have context as to how our business is using Lucidchart uh, webinars and using Zoom. Um, so aside from my professional life, uh, I'm happily married. I have a wife. I have two kids. She doesn't know I put this picture up here of her. <laughs> she probably wouldn't be too happy <laughs> if she found out. But um, again, really excited to be here. And uh, yeah, let's continue on. So moving on to the next slide here. Let me see if this works. Great, so uh, some numbers about Lucidchart so you have more context who we are. And, and, and we've been around for eight years. We have about 13 million users worldwide. So we're a cloud-based diagram flowchart platform. A lot of people know us as like you know the busy, the lift of sh the lift and shift of Microsoft Visio. Uh, we've been around again eight years. We get about 500,000 registrations per month. I mean, our founders, our president, and our executive team have really built this awesome, incredible machine of registrations. So we have the opportunity to test a lot of cool things, and a lot of those uh, marketing initiatives have been webinars, and so on. So. Our webinar program started, and these were the three main objectives. Okay, if you haven't launched your webinar program, you first have to sit down with marketing, sales, operations, etc., and figure out why the heck do we want to do webinars. And for us at Lucidchart specifically, it was the following three reasons. Number one, we wanted to increase our thought leadership. If we could establish ourselves as a thought leadership or a thought leader in specific verticals, we believe we would have increased success and awareness and recognition. Number two, that we would have specifically lead generation, an increased amount of lead generation. And number three, we wanted to train our users on how they could use Lucidchart for X, Y, and Z reasons specific to them. So again, what are your three specific goals of why you want to launch webinars, okay, or why you want to continue your webinar program on both resources, on talent, and effort. So fast forward two and a half years later, what does our program have achieved so far? Okay, so number one, we, in 2017, we had specifically 57 webinars that we were able to launch over the period of 12 months, okay? Over that period of 12 months specifically, we were able to get around 23,000 registrations. So those are people that came to our specific website and registered, put their information and said, I want to attend this webinar. Okay, out of those people that registered, around 8,000 of them signed up and actually attended. Out of those 8,000, right, after the webinar's over, we put them on a specific gate, on a specific website, and then 7,000 of them watched the webinar on demand. Again, in the year 2017. Now this is real data, raw data. Again, I, haven't, I don't have data yet for 2018 because we haven't finished the year, but these numbers in 2018 are looking bigger and better. But this is, again, 12 months worth of data, and I have five tips that I want to show you and share with you, and I hope that you can take good notes. I'm gonna be here also for questions. If you have questions towards the end of the presentation, we're also gonna be passing around a mic. So you can ask your question. If not, I'll be around here. You can connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter if I don't answer your question right away, but let's get to it. So number one, you need to be, be able to build a solid webinar tech stack. So what the heck does a webinar tech stack look like? Let me start out with a quote, Abraham Lincoln. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. So how are you sharpening your ax before launching and hosting webinars? So it starts and it goes as follows. For us, at Lucidchart, I needed to really make sure we had the best webinar platform in the market. I looked at BlueJeans and it wasn't it. 
I looked at WebEx and it wasn't it. I looked at GoToMeeting and it wasn't it. I found Zoom two and a half years ago, three years ago, and I'm like, holy crap. This is the best webinar platform, and I'm gonna tell you why and just a reason in the, plat in the, market, in the market of just webinars, platforms. So we chose Zoom and we went with Zoom. Next is we needed a marketing automation platform. Why? When you have marketing automation in place set up correctly, the people that register for your webinars are then able to communicate with you and you with them and back and forth. If you don't have a marketing automation platform, then you're missing out on the foundation and the benefits and features that your webinar platform can, can do for you. Next, we chose uh, our Salesforce, or what, as we like to call it, our system of record. Where are the leads gonna go after they register for a webinar, whether they attend or not, and when are, are they gonna be handed off to sales? And last but not least, where are the webinars gonna live on after they are over? For us, it is Wistia. Again, our foundational platform for success in webinars at Lucichart, when we were able to host 57 webinars in a single year, was Zoom. On top of that, marketing automation, it was Marketo. On top of that was Salesforce, and on top of that is Wistia, okay? So, so, so what, right? What, what, now that I've told you this, what happens next? How can you create a solid webinar tech stack? You need to map out your process. What I just shared with you, the tech stack for us, was it's what worked for us, okay? And before I went out and bought all these platforms, before I connected all these integrations and all these, all these data, data platforms, I needed to map out with my team what are the steps that need to happen and what are the platforms and technologies that I need in place to be able to run these webinars successfully. So again, map out your webinar process that you currently have or that you wish to have and then go out and choose the vendors, okay? If you do it backwards, you're doing it wrong. Again, tip number two, listen to your freaking audience. Never make assumptions. They know what they want and they know what they should be able to tell you what you need to be posting your webinars of. At Lucidchart, in our very, very first webinar, I didn't want to make it into a product pitch. So most webinars, right, depending on where it is on the funnel, the number one webinar that most marketers do or the most business or operations people do is like, let's talk about our product. Our product, and this is how our product or service lets you achieve X, Y, Z. So assuming that that's not what our users wanted at Lucidchart, I said, you know what, let's not, let's not talk about Lucidchart. Let's talk about something totally different, okay? Uh, to create thought leadership. Our first webinar was, how to create an effective bug report that actually gets resolved. And to my surprise, we didn't get that many registrations. Okay, we, get to, we got about 1,200 registrations. Out of those 1,200 registrations, we got 249 attendees. So here I am going to our CEO and president and be like, hey, we just launched our webinar platform, our webinar marketing program, and this is what we got. No, there's room for improvement, okay? The second webinar um, was a little bit modified based on this. Based on the feedback that we got from our audience, this is what happened. Can you do a webinar on diagrams and flowcharts next time? I'm like, sure, why not? You want a lucid chart? I'll freaking give you a lucid chart. Next thing you know, I got the president and CEO of lucid chart and a Harvard Business Review scholar, author, uh, presenter, and we called a webinar called How to Create Persuasive Charts, Diagrams, and Data Visualizations, uh, and that was the webinar. I'm like, you know what? This is a little bit more lucid chart focused. That's what the audience wants. Let's give that to them. So again, the results were a little bit better, and this is what happened. We got, we got about 2,900 registrations, and we got about 100, 830 attendees. That's a 28%. Not bad, there's improvement from the previous webinar, but it still wasn't enough. I mean, I, I really knew that we could have better results based on how many number of people were using our product. So we looked at the feedback, and somebody uh, in a, either a post-webinar, post-webinar email survey, or uh, you know, in the chat, or, or the live polling, somebody said the following, I'm completely disappointed. I thought this was going to be a live lucid chart training. Um, so what happened? I'm like, okay, again, people want lucid chart, I'll give them lucid chart. Next thing, I found our lucid chart product pro, good looking guy, nobody knew the product better than he could. I'm like, hey man, I'm gonna put you in the webinar, you're gonna speak and talk about Lucia Chart for 45 minutes. That's what people freaking want, okay? And that's the last thing, if you remember when I started the webinar program at Lucia Chart, that's the last thing that came to my mind. Well, to my surprise, this is what happened. 
4,500 people signed up from a single email blast, okay? And out of those 4,500, a record-breaking 36% of them attended, which is 1,600 people, okay? So what was the feedback from that webinar? It's as follows. Okay, the webinar was engaging, informative, inspiring, and memorable. I will definitely share with others. Okay, so never, so what I want you to take away from this is as follows, never make assumptions on what your audience wants. Always use data, always use the services that Zoom or other platforms may provide. So how did we listen to our audience? In Zoom, there are two cool new features, not new, well new for me when I started using the Zoom webinars. Number one, you could do live chatting within webinar platform, so then people would chat and tell us like, hey, what's going on, or where are the Lucid Chart trainings, where's this template, okay? And either the presenter needs to be paying attention to the chat, or get somebody else that's not in the screen paying attention to the chat. Or number two, live polling. You gotta take advantage of live freaking polling, and I'm gonna go more in details of, of the benefits of live polling. Off the Zoom webinar platform, obviously you can do email surveys, and you can just pay attention to the social media feeds if you have a webinar-specific hashtag. So that's tip number two. Listen to your audience, okay? Tip number three, it's content is king, okay? So what does, webin what does content is king mean? Well, you first need to start with the webinar content format. It is 2 freaking 2018, okay? And most webinars look something like this. And this is good, that's not bad. Most people have audio and slides, okay? Again, it's 2018. We have way better technology nowadays than just audio and slides. If your webinar categories or themes or formats are in the audio and slides, there's room for improvement. You could do way better, right, with a Zoom platform. Number two, if you wanna take it up a notch and step up your game webinar, then you can do uh, what I call the better category, is audio, slides, and screen sharing, okay? And now, that's better than good, right? There's more engagement, there's more interaction. But if you really want to kill it and increase your engagement, increase your retention for webinars, increase everything and make your customers really happy or prospects, you want to be in the best category. The best category is where you have audio, is where you have slides, is where you have screen sharing, and then also where you have video, okay? Video, it is crucial that you turn on your video and that you show people, hey, I am a human being behind this screen, behind this platform, and people like to see other people's faces. So take advantage of this. Webinar content format matters more than ever before. And don't be shy, you don't need to be looking amazing, just turn it on, clean the camera, make sure it's not blurry, uh, and that you don't have, obviously, there's other webinar tips that I could go on on how to make yourself look good. I mean, raise the camera, eye level, make sure that the sun's not behind you, make sure there's light in front of you, et cetera. I'm sure that uh, out there in the Expo Hall, there's better tips on how to go look good on camera, so highly recommend those. So after we went into the best category, we started getting feedback such as, this is one of the very best presentations in any format I have ever seen, okay? So moving on here, what are the webinar content themes that you could create that you should be able to analyze or execute on? So we obviously separated our webinar themes in three categories. They're top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and bottom of the funnel. So we soon realized that Top of the funnel was gonna be the thought leadership webinars, the webinars that we did not talk about Lucidchart, okay? Number two was gonna be Lucidchart tips, meaning this is how you use Lucidchart for marketing, this is how you use Lucidchart for sales, and, and things like that, but not very product focused. Uh, Lucidchart 101 is like, hey, this is how you use Lucidchart to map out your process, to visualize complex ideas, to bring clarity to your company. And then 201, an advanced version of that, and then persona specific is like, this is how this feature in Lucid Charts helps you do account mapping in Salesforce if you're in sales. So you need to create a theme, right, for each stage of the buying process or the buyer process or the buyer framework or journey, whatever you wanna call it, in order to be successful at webinars. If not, you could be doing thought leadership webinars month after month after month, and then you're wondering, well, why am I not getting the success that I'm hoping for that other people keep talking about? Diversify your themes and you'll be golden. Once you diversify your themes, once you get the ball rolling, then you can create something like this, whether in a spreadsheet, or in Google Analytics, or Google Docs, or Google Spreadsheets, whatever you wanna call it, and next thing you know, then you can start tracking results, see what works, what doesn't work, and move on. So, what's the key takeaway 
of how to create awesome content for webinars. Number one, you need to be relevant. The content needs to be very, very relevant. Do not pitch your products right away. This is like a top of the funnel. Or how can you make it relevant? Make sure you invite the right people to the right webinar. Don't blast everybody at once, assuming that everybody wants to learn about a specific topic or theme. Number two, you want to make sure that your webinar is anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. If it's 15 minutes, that's okay. Have you ever wondered why TED Talks are so freaking good? Not only is the content really, really high quality and really good, but they're short, right? Who has time to sit down for 45 freaking minutes and consume everything you're saying and every slide that you're presenting? It's 2018, nobody does. So 30 minutes is okay, 45 minutes, you know, not bad, but don't be, don't be worried if your content is just 15 minutes or 30 minutes or less. The next one is you wanna make sure that um, you add value. Again, don't pitch, add value. Be different, be unique. As Seth Godin likes to say, be the purple cow that stands out. Again, don't be too weird. Uh, otherwise, that would just people push people away even further from you or your company. And educate, educate, educate. Don't hold back to your tips, to your tricks, to your secret sauce. That's what people want to see. Be telling people and educate people on what most people are not telling others. Okay. Tip number four. So if content is king, then I like to say for webinar purposes that presentation is queen. So for presentation, we wanted to mix things up at Lucidchart and not just have internal people talk about Lucidchart products, not internal people talk about thought leadership topics and themes. What we wanted to do is like, what if we got world-class speakers and became friends with them and then have them have a conversation with one of our internal champions or one of our internal employees and talk about a trending topic, whether it's SEO, whether it's operations, whether it's ABM, whether it's video conferencing, whether it's like, you name it. So we went out to the industry that we're in that we wanted to target, the vertical, and we found awesome speakers. So we were able to build a really good relationship with Tiffany Bova at Salesforce, with Mark Roberts, former CRO of HubSpot, he's now a current lecturer at Harvard, um, Mary Shea of Forrester, New York Times bestselling author Tim Sanders, Aubrey Blanche from Atlassian. And we told them, hey, we believe you're a world-class presenter. We would like to do a webinar with you and talk about the topic of your choice. We were not actually choosing the topic. We were letting them, since they're the experts, choose what topic they wanted to. Obviously, we gave them a few ideas. Like, hey, we believe that you'd be really good at talking to some of these specific topics. Which one would you like to discuss? Great, and it'll be a conversation. So most of them, actually all of them, agreed to do a webinar with us at one point in time in 2017 and the results were amazing, okay? So what does that webinar presentation format look like? This is really, really important. We got the world-class speakers in place, and now what happens next? So most of you are very familiar with the individual presenter format. That's when one of you or somebody in your company goes up, opens up a Zoom webinar or the webinar platform of choice, and then you start talking, push the webinar live, and then bam, dust the webinar and it's over. Now that's great, but the retention rate and the attendee, attendance rate was not the best, according to all 57 webinars that we did in 2017. The second format that we found out that had a little bit better uh, percentages, again, of attendees, people registering, people uh, enga engagement percentage, a Zoom webinar uh, can give you that data, and other, and other features was the panel discussion. So panel discussions are great. Uh, another format that you can use, again, Diversify these, try them out, test them out. And another one that we found a lot of success was the co-presenters co or co-presentation co method. And now, again, diversify your specific webinar presentation format in instead of just doing the same old just individual presenter over and over and over, okay? Um, so what, what's the main takeaway from this? So how many of you have seen Wolf of Wall Street? Raise your hand. Okay, now there's a lot of things I do not agree <laughs> with Jordan Belford. This is what he actually looks like in real life, the Wolf of Wall Street. There's one thing that really stood out to me, okay, that I saw a lot in common that these world-class presenters had. It's as follows. 45%, okay, of your communication is your tone of voice. Another 45% of, your, of the communication is your body language. And then the last 10% is actually what you say. So in the end, we didn't disqualify other presenters that 
I mean, that, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you need to be able to turn on the video. Because once you turn on the video in a webinar, then people can see your body language. Then people can see your mouth moving, and people can understand your tone of voice way better. And this is one thing that I believe that made these world-class presenters so good at webinars when we teamed up with them at Lucidchart. My last tip, tip number five, always be testing. If you're not testing, you're not winning. That's what I like to say. So what things can you test in your webinar programs? What things can you test as you are currently in your before, during, and after stage? So a few things that come to mind that I like to share with you is as follows. Before, what are a few things that you can test before you do a webinar? Well, how, how long, how many characters is the webinar title? Okay, what, what are the promotional images going to look like on mobile or on desktop, on social media, on LinkedIn, or on Twitter? Okay, what is the promotional timeline? Are we going to promote the email two weeks before? Are we going to promote the, the webinar a month before? Okay, two months before? We've seen the highest amount of open rates, registration rates, two weeks before a webinar. So if you had to promote a webinar and send, let's say, three emails, and you send those three emails two months before, a month before, and two weeks before, the email that we always consistently sent two weeks before outperformed most of them. Even the week of the webinar outperformed anything else of the promotion timeline because people like to just register to things last minute. Okay? So this, here are a few items that you could, re you could try out before. During a webinar, Zoom platform gives you phenomenal, outstanding features that you could test out. You could test out live polling. How many of you in the room um, have used live polling in, uh, in webinar? Th they're amazing. Like, they're mind-blowing. Uh, how you're able to set them up in the middle of the webinar, how are you able to set them up before the webinar? So again, what's your Q&A uh, style like? Can you test those? Yes. Can you test your live polling? Yes. If you're not testing new things every single time you do a webinar, you're missing out on new opportunities that you've made assumptions, but that you'd never tried because you were just either too afraid or you didn't know that you could even test those. Again, here are, these are a list of things that you could test during a webinar. Uh, live streaming functionality, so Zoom webinars lets you live stream on YouTube and on Facebook. When is the last time that you did a webinar, if you're using a Zoom webinars, and live stream on YouTube and on Facebook? Why not try it and see what happens? And last but not least, the third category after is here's what you could test after a webinar. So a post-webinar email, you can test the, you know, a lead scoring mechanism that you have in place, the lead handoff, uh, on-demand gates, and nurturing workflows. So uh, one example that comes to mind is um, for lead scoring. For example, when, we, um, when we're passing leads to the sales team, we're trying to determine Let's say we get 600 registrations for a webinar. Out of those 600 registrations, let's say 300, 50% of them attended. Out of those 300, then what do we give to our sales teams? Do we just give them all 300 of those? Well, we found out after doing some analysis and getting our data team involved that anybody who had at least five loose chart licenses or more in their account of whoever registered, whether they attended or didn't attend, had a likely, a like, a, like a 70% likely, like chance that they would actually set a demo with our sales reps. So how were we able to do that? Again, just testing, seeing different variables in our lead scoring, and then and analyzing, and then making some hypotheses, and then passing in different waves or faces to our sales team specific leads based on specific behaviors or technographics that our registrations or attendees had. So again, here's a few things that you can test. And the list go on and on and on. But I highly encourage that you test. I highly encourage that you do your best to try new things consistently. Your buyers, our buyers, are changing so rapidly. Okay, that's the only thing that's constant, change. If you're not changing as fast as your buyers, then you're leaving money on the table. So here are top three webinar testing wins or takeaways that we found out. And I've actually never shared these publicly, so here we go. Number one. So ask for the demo via live polling in middle of the webinar. Again, ask for the demo live in the webinar through live polling. So usually when you have a webinar, when you do a webinar, you put them through a specific drip campaign and it says, okay, if this person did this, then send them these three emails. If they open this email, then send them this one. And at the end of the drip campaign is something like watch a demo or buy our product. So why are we waiting so long to ask for a demo 
when you can utilize the live polling function and 15 minutes into the webinar, once you're presenting the best content you've ever created, say, want to learn more about this? Talk to our Lucid Enterprise sales teams, yes or no? And then people live poll right there. Every single time we did that, we at least got 15 demo sets live in the webinar, and we handed those off immediately. So what is your call to action? What is the end result or objective that you're trying to achieve through emails, right, post-webinar, that you can just inject, okay, in a non-spammy man manner into the webinar and do it through live polling, okay? That's, that's the biggest takeaway that I would say we found out by doing a lot of these tests. Number two, we realized that if we wanted high engagement, high retention, and high attendance rate, then we needed to have at least two presenters at once that bounce ideas back and forth. So here's Joe, here's Sally, and then they just, for 30 minutes, we talk about a specific subject. Again, we tried to fit everything in the best category, audio, slides, screen sharing, and video, and then Sally and Joe would just bounce ideas back and forth. Why does that kind of work so well? If you think about it, you have two different genders, two different tones of voices, two different people that look different, and people like to see diversity, and you have two windows with videos that help you see, okay, this person's talking, now this person's talking. It keeps people just stay awake. So co-presenters, highly, highly recommend them if you want to increase your statistics of uh, many features that you have in Zoom webinar. And number three, email trumps all promo channels. If you had to compete with like ads to drive webinar registrations, whether it's social ads, Google Analytics ads, or any sort of promotional channel, if you had to um, ask your sales reps to promote the webinar, if you had to put at the uh, bottom of your email footer that you're doing a webinar, if you had to do any other promotional channel, nothing, nothing in this day and age trumps email. So you better have a dang good email list. If you're not hitting your email effectively, you're gonna see a pretty low registration rate and attendance rate, obviously, of those who sign up and attend your webinar. Again, if you're seeing a low number of registrations, then you should focus first on growing your email list before even launching a webinar, if quality and quantity is your goal as well. So one of my last, uh, before I end here, is one of my favorite quotes is like, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work, Thomas Edison. So again, I highly encourage that you test over and over and over. Never make assumptions. Assumptions is what's really gonna not help you progress. And that is it and that's all. I think just cram through this. So thank you so much for coming. We'll open any questions. Uh, where's the mic gonna be at? Okay, yeah, um, we have someone going around with the mic. Yeah, right here. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah. Can you say what time of uh, day or what day of the week that you tend to get the best uh, attendance to the webinars for? Great question. Um, what I'm about to tell you works for us. It might not work for you. So don't ever, if you ever read anything that tells you this is the best time to do a LinkedIn post or a best tweet or a best Facebook post or the best webinar, it's all BS. Like, don't ever, ever believe that, please. So to answer your question, this is what works for me. I'm not saying it's going to work for you. For us, it's Tuesdays and Wednesdays at noon Mountain Time, so 11 a.m. Pacific Time. Tuesdays and Wednesdays. At 11, huh? Okay. Yep. So, so Tuesdays and Wednesdays, ideally Tuesday. So let's, if I had to categorize the ABC, number one choice would be uh, Tuesday. Number two would be Wednesday. Number three would be Wednesday, all at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. Uh -huh. At okay. that rate, uh, if you think about it, it's like, okay, Monday people are trying to catch up with the weekend. Friday people are checked out, uh, and then people like to do it during lunch. Again. Mm. That's okay. what works for Lucid Chart. Thanks. So, mm -hmm. Good question. Yes, let's go over here. Thank you for running. I can do the running if you want. Thank you. Yep. Um, thinking about content mm -hmm. and also maybe a little bit into presentation, um, we do educational webinars at my org. Okay. And I'm trying to think of a way, or if you have any tips, mm -hmm. of making the Q&A portion of a webinar mm -hmm. just as engaging and just as successful of an experience for the users. Mm -hmm. So what, are you in the education EDU K-12 space? or? No, I work for a nonprofit, so we do okay. uh, media justice type webinars. So, and you're currently using Zoom webinars or just webinars? Mm -hmm. okay. Zoom webinars. So, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but when the, I highly recommend that the person that's doing the webinar, the presenter, also has somebody next to them or in front of them, 
and it's actually answering doing the live Q&A there, where you can say click on the option answer live or answer later. Do you currently have somebody like that? Yeah. Okay, so, so your question is how can you make it more, even more engaging? Yeah, I mean, basically just any tips you have around making the Q&A part, like, because we'll see a lot of drop yeah. off when you move to the Q&A section. So everyone okay. checks Got out. Got it. So I recommend start doing questions, like do three Q&A sections throughout the webinar, one at five minutes, one at 15 minutes, and then one towards the end. Most people do Q&As at the very, very end, where only like 40 to 50% of the people have actually stayed, maybe 60. So do at the beginning, like, okay, hey, welcome everybody to the webinar. My name is Gabe VMSR. Let's start a, a question here, or let's start a chat. Where are you tuning in from? Everybody put your country or your city or your state. And then bam, everybody starts engaging like Mexico, oh, Venezuela, oh, Utah, Salt Lake City. And then next thing you know, you have 50, everybody wants to talk about themselves. So find those keywords that are relevant or not relevant. I mean, relevant in a way that's like fun as well. But I would recommend either with the chat, chatting widget or feature or the live Q&A doing like one five minutes in uh, as to like, and again, don't, don't make those questions about your product. Don't make those questions about like something that you're trying to trick them into. They can smell BS hundreds of miles away, so. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So when you have the, the co-presenters mm -hmm. in, in, in a Zoom mm -hmm. webinar, um, within the Zoom platform, what's, you can have um, panelists or co-hosts. Mm -hmm. So do you set up the co-presenter mm -hmm. as What's the difference between a panelist or a co-host? And then if, if you have slides that, yeah. that they're using to present from, do you let them control the slides or do you have someone, you or someone within your organization, a moderator controlling the slides? Excellent question. What we found best is that, let's say I'm hosting the, the webinar and in a totally different room in the same building, hopefully, or in a different side of the world, you have the other person co-presenting. Don't put two people jammed in a little screen next to each other like, hey, like, what's up? <laughs> That's happened before at our company, unfortunately. Um, but you want each person plugged into the wall with the setup with the you know, webcam or their laptop or desktop eye level in two different rooms. One person hosting it, the other person co-hosting it, not as panelists. Because then what happens is if you add them as panelists, they don't have all the features and functionalities that a co-host has, I believe. As, I mean, Zoom is changing so fast, I can't keep up sometimes with all the features they launch, which is amazing. But we do that so that way the other panelist has also access to move the slides back and forth. We usually just recommend the host or one or the other, host or co-host has access to the slides. And only one person moves it. We tried it in the past both, and then they just kept going back and forth. <laughs> Didn't look so good. Yeah. It's a good question, but okay. uh, yeah, different rooms, different uh, you know, devices, and, uh, but yeah, just have them host and co-host. Is it important for the, um, the co-host to have a, a wired ethernet connection? Or? Yes, yeah? absolutely, hands down. Okay. Like, I, I, I'm so picky with how we would do webinars that some people are like, Gabe, like, why do I need to be plugged into the wall to the power? I'm like, I don't care, dude, don't ask questions. I'm telling you, like, I've seen it all. Doing 57 webinars in a year, you need to prevent and foresee anything that could happen and could go wrong and, and just do it. But yeah, ethernet, wired, power to the wall, lights, you know, gum, water, everything. And like, did you already go to the bathroom? You know, like you have to babysit them, so detailed. Uh, and again, I'm not the one doing the webinars most of the times. I get the you know, people who are better than me. So the person, if you're running your webinars and you're hosting and presenting, great. If you have someone who's better than you, don't be afraid to ask them give them the vision of what webinars could look like and then have them kind of, you know, you're the quarterback, but have them be, you know, you're the producer, have somebody, you know, be like the, the Brad Pitt and you're the Steven Spielberg or, or, or Jennifer Aniston and you're the, you know, whatever. Okay, good question. I just had some, I just had some feedback regarding the co-presenters because mm -hmm. we do that too, but we're not in different rooms, but we do have our own setup. Okay. So, I mean, it works the same. It's not like someone has to be in another room to do it, but just making sure that you both have your own ability to be mm -hmm. on as an individual so that, um, you know, you do have that same ability to move the slides or whatever that might be. So, just for what it's worth, I just wanted to put that Do you in guys there. have, like, 
headsets then or like we actually use a audio? little Jabra um, speaker at this point okay cool. is what that we works. do because we play some audio and some video and that kind of thing and it, that's so far worked out for us great yeah okay that's another option mm -hmm. thanks for sharing okay thank you for uh, this talk yeah um, Really cool, so f I mean, really cool, uh, and nice shoes, by the way. Thanks. Uh, I'll definitely remember you when I see you out at happy hour. Um, <laughs> Somebody told me, it's like, hey, it's red, white, and blue, even though I'm Venezuelan, like American. <laughs> I'm like, sure, why not? <laughs> it works, it works. Thanks, appreciate it. So my name is Christian Banks, okay. and I'm an IT project manager. Mm -hmm. uh, I work internally. All my clients are employees, so kind of a, I'm kind of taking a different uh, take Okay. on the webinar, and I'm wondering your thoughts around um, using this internally to either change the narrative around IT or um, education, mm -hmm. educating our, um, our user base, or I'm also thinking of ways to use webinars for uh, adoption, you know, whether it's uh, Office 365, mm -hmm. or when to use Team or Yammer, you know that yep. kind of thing, uh, and I'm, and and that thought leadership that really spoke to me as far as positioning IT in a in a certain way um, versus, hey, do this for us, IT, or you know, have more visibility as well. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great question. So we just um, bought Zoom. Wall to, as a wall-to-wall -wall solution. So all 400 people at Lucidchart will now have some sort of version of Zoom. We started out with Zoom webinars. So I, I can't speak to the functionalities of Zoom large meetings, or, or maybe other people in the room are familiar with that. Zoom webinars should be able to do what you wanted to do, what you just told me. Right. I absolutely recommend you should compare Zoom webinars and what it looks like to do an internal sort of webinar with Zoom large meetings or meeting rooms. Webinars are absolutely a good way to do something both externally and internally. Right. And that's gonna elevate you and give you visibility, respect, and awareness of like, IT is just not there when we need them. It's like, IT is ed trying to educate us. They're trying to really instruct me on how to move forward, how to not screw up and give my passwords, or how to set up my Yammer or my Microsoft Teams uh, instance. Absolutely, I think you should right. definitely try it and let me know how it goes, but absolutely. Thank you, Gabe. Yep. Just a real, real quick one. To, do, do your presenters mm -hmm. in room or remote users, are you leveraging the virtual uh, background green screen and, and does that give consistency and something like that? So, uh, great question. We haven't. And the reason why is because we're in Utah and our background like the mountains. So, <laughs> it's this awesome <laughs> visibility right away. Um, but if we, that wasn't the background, you know, it's either I would you definitely utilize that. So I was talking with uh, one of our teammates was talking to the CEO of, uh, yeah, Eric Yuan. Is that how you say his last name? Yuan, Yuan, CEO of Zoom. When he called him, he put our logo as his background. It's like, are you kidding me? This is the CEO of a company, right? Unicorn, you know, valued over a billion dollars calling one of our teammates with his back, with our background of our logo. So there's awesome use cases of that. We haven't leveraged them, but if we didn't have that background again, we'd definitely be leveraging those. Uh, with a call to action, with a logo, with our team members in the background, or either funny, humor, or educational, or with a call to action. Just don't put it like 20% off, buy now, you know, don't like make it more like subtle, you know. But let me, have you used them or? or okay. We, uh, yeah, I should, we, should, I should, we should play around with that more, Lucy Chart. Good question. Yes. I, wanted, I wanted to follow up to uh, the green screen here. Uh, our executives are located throughout the U.S., and we use green screens to get them comfortable to being on video. And uh, we're a data center company, so what okay. we use is we use the background as if they're in a data center. Oh, and cool. so they're actually more comfortable <laughs> being at home and actually turning on their webcam. And, uh, it's, it's actually idea. driven, uh, the, the video... Um, adoption? Adoption, yes. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. It's a good idea. Uh, so, sorry. Um, so, uh, on that note of the green screen, I work yeah. for a company called Webaround, which does make the green screen that integrates with Zoom. There and you go. so, we found actually by branding and being able to brand companies that are mm -hmm. using that, it actually helps with retention or it helps with that, you know, brand loyalty to them or brand recognition. So, just as another way to, you know, utilize it, definitely suggested to use the virtual background and do that. 
Love it. Always be testing. I like that. Thanks for sharing. One more question there. What live polling technology do you guys utilize? What, what technology? For live polling. Uh, the, the Zoom webinar. Oh, okay, just has built an in. internal live polling webinar. I'm telling you, it's one of the most basic and most powerful features that people just utilize as like, how is the percenter of the webinar on a scale to one through 10? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, that's what everybody does. Utilize it for something different, be relevant, be unique. But yeah, Zoom has a live poll that works both on mobile, if you're viewing it, and on desktop, obviously iPad, uh, mobile, you know, laptop, things like that. But yeah, try it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Ben Eiler. I'm with uh, the Aspen Institute. And we uh, are an NGO, nonprofit NGO, that okay. does a, a reaches out to a, a large demographic uh, around uh, nationally and internationally. Um, with some of the engagement um, that some of our programs work with, is there a way to filter out uh, polling, or how does that display up um, on the screen when people are viewing it? So when there's two features as of like, again, Zoom is making so many cool changes so fast that it's hard to keep up. And, and I have so many people right running the webinar program. Uh, that's not just me now. Um, so when you set up your live polling, it's a pop-up window that shows up that you can either say people can't X out of it or people can't advance and exit the window unless they answer some of the you know, multi multiple choice criteria or, or type in their answer, whatever it is. So there's a way to kind of you know, make it very intrusive or make it just skip or just, yeah. But there's one of those, I play around with whichever way you think works best for your audience. But yeah, it gives you that functionality. And again, it pops up on, on mobile, desktop. It's very, it's very friendly. Sometimes um, it might, I believe you can move it around. Sometimes, again, this is when we launched, sometimes it would come up and block the presenter, the video. But I think you can move it around now, so it's not just like bam and in, in, in their face. But it's it's nice and small, and it just gets it gets the point across. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Oh, another question back there now. Okay, thank you so much for coming. I'll be available. That's my email. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter. Thank you again. Appreciate it.